so great to have you join us as we officially start up season two of The Blue Files. I'm Edward and I'd appreciate your time today. The goal of this web series is to connect and share stories that may otherwise not get the spotlight, but all of them involve our changing planet. On today's show, we're going to get a look at the surprising numbers on the global tree count. Plus, France is offering a sky-high commute, and we'll learn how to save the world's stinkiest flower. So let's begin. And to help me with that, we say hello to my co-host, Christina Stevens. Great to see you, Christina. And you, Amor. We do, of course, live in Canada, known for all of its trees. And there's always that old saying, you know, you can't see the forest for the trees. For this story, I'm thinking it's more like you can't see the trees for the forest. Researchers say that they have what they say is the first scientifically credible estimate of tree species. The good news is mm -hmm. there are about 14% more species than they ever thought before. Now, here's the thing. They Ooh. estimate there's a total of about 73,300 species around the world. Of those, 9,200 wow. are yet to be discovered. Now, it kind of makes me feel a little ignorant because it didn't even occur to me that there'd be so many undiscovered species. I kind of <laughs> thought they would just yeah. know about them all by now. And how, how are these trees hiding, right? <laughs> Uh, so where are they hiding? Well, sorry. Yeah. And that's a testament to, you know, just uh, how amazing our planet is. Right. There's just so many discoveries that are just waiting for us. Um, so I think that's a good thing for sure. But where would these be then? Uh, do, do we the researchers sort of have an idea where this hidden jackpot of tree species are? Mostly in tropical regions. The researchers say about half mm. of those undiscovered ones are in South America, followed distantly by Eurasia, Africa, and about 15% of those ones here in North America. So you might go into a forest and find some tree that nobody has ever seen or documented before. So it's all very exciting in that side. Of course, there is a downside. You knew there had to be one. Mm -hmm. uh, because of these rare species mostly being in tropical forests, they're really at high risk. You know, yeah. those forests are disappearing, uh, not due to climate change, but also deforestation. So this is a very good mm -hmm. argument for doing even more to protect those forests. Uh, and not just for the trees, for the clean air, but because they are a source of timber and of food for a lot of communities. So it's important that yeah. going forward, we keep them around. So I was wondering, you know, how do researchers figure this out? Like, how do they think, oh, there are this many species, and now we think there are that many. So basically, they looked at this yeah. database, right? Tens of millions of trees mm -hmm. in 100,000 different forest settings. And then they used, you know, statistical wow. techniques, which we all love, right? <laughs> That's so much fun, statistics. Yeah. And they kind of tried to... <laughs> Fill in the gaps where they think these tree species are. So uh, according to the Proceedings mm -hmm. of the National Academy of Sciences Journal, which is where this is all published, okay. they quote lead researchers saying that it'll help them figure out where biodiversity is the most threatened and the most vulnerable. So that way we can mm -hmm. really target those areas the most going forward for protection. We all know the benefits of having trees. Of course, they give us oxygen, they store carbon, provide habitat for wildlife. But extending from that, perhaps a little lesser known, I mean, they help stabilize the soil. In fact, help filter water runoff from storms, which reduces pollutants that get washed into lakes and oceans. So I think this is very exciting news on so many levels, the fact that we have a lot more trees. The thing here is, you know, it's also about, you know, protecting what we have already, the discovered ones, not just the ones that are not discovered. Exactly. And I think that is one issue that needs to get the spotlight. Uh, there has been obviously a huge push to plant more trees in an effort to combat climate change. And I'm all for that. But you mentioned about drought and, and that is a major thing in deforestation. We need to protect the trees that the earth already has. I was doing some reading out of California they estimate in the last decade alone, over 140 million trees have died. And that's not to do with wildfires. It is because of drought, disease and pests. So, you know, trees are the longest living species on Earth. But we have to put an effort forward to protect what we have, discover, you know, these new ones. Because, listen, I think they offer so many solutions to humanity. You know, uh, some people say the cure to cancer may be sitting into the rainforest. So very exciting news. I think overall, anytime there's an uptick, you know, in that column of there's more of when it comes to trees, 
it's a win-win for everybody. Very exciting news. Exactly. And you know, it made me curious though. What what is the rarest tree that we actually know about? So I you know took to Google and all that fun stuff. So there's this one tree on an island just off the coast yeah. of New Zealand. I, I can pretend to pronounce it Penantinga Baseliniana, okay. maybe. Um, it's the only one left. Okay. And what happened was, when you talk about all the threats to different trees, here's one you might not have thought of. They introduced goats to this island at one point, many, 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 many years ago. And the goats ate all the saplings around. So this tree ended up being the only one left in the world. So wow. they tried sort of breeding it on the mainland again, mm -hmm. and they're having some success. Mm -hmm. They're scared to, to, you know, bring any sort of saplings or seedlings to the island because they don't want to introduce right. any any disease or anything but to think yeah. that there's one literally yeah. one of this tree left in the wild and it's because of something humans did they brought goats to graze there and yeah. left them and they ate all the yeah. trees so that's it's even what small are you mean? things <laughs> but it's even yes. the small things that yes. we do as humans that can impact nature that's which right. i found intriguing so yeah well, and you know, as a parent, uh, I mean, my dream is to take the kids out west to see the huge sequoia trees, right? I mean, these big, massive, or redwoods. I mean, they're just so majestic. Um, and the fact, as you're saying, some of these are dying off literally. If the next generation will not be able to see something like that in, in, in real life, you know, only yeah. seeing it in digital medium, right? Um, so listen, I think this is a great uh, story overall, and it's something we should continue to follow, the, the fact that they have discovered more trees. They're really, really inspiring. Let's over to, head over to France now. You know, many cities around the world continue to invest in green technology uh, for public transportation, but Paris is taking it one step further. They plan on launching a new cable car high in the sky. And I say, fantastique. <laughs> I mean, this is really cool. It is <laughs> going to be a gondola. Say oh, absolutely. <laughs> It'll be the to first work. ever public transit gondola in yes, in France. Now, they're calling it right now something unfrench, cable A. Or oh. how would you say that in, in how romantic in is that? <laughs> like, <laughs> well, maybe the most yes, romantic that's city true. in the world. I'm they going to take cable A. <laughs> cable to, A. Down, down. Hopefully that evolves. It is going to link several outlying neighborhoods in Paris and the southeastern suburbs to a metro line. And this idea, which I thought was really interesting, it was one of several options. They also examined perhaps doing a high-speed train. But as it turns out, the cable car solution was, in fact, the cheapest one. They figured they could build this because they're just building on top. They don't have to build around or dig underneath or whatever. They'll just put up these little towers and go over it at a cost of about 132 million euros. What's that? About 180 million Canadian. And I was thinking 180 million. Remember the Toronto uh, line? I was just four, going to Shepherd say, how's line? that? Or how's that Eglinton line going that's still not finished? And how much does each station you know, cost on that line that's still not finished? Uh, the Shepherd line, which yeah. is about 5K of track, is a billion bucks. And that was built when? So, I mean, how much would it be today? Exactly. It, it took, well, this is what I'm saying. So I think it's a brilliant idea. And they're saying, as they, they start to break down you know, this full plan, It'll have the capability of carrying over 12,000 people every hour each way. So it's not a, you know, you suggested uh, romantic, and I guess some could say it would be, but this is, to, it's a people mover. It's to get people going where they need to go during uh, the commute time. It's, it's just shy of five clicks. There's going to be five stations, and it's all electric powered as well. Wow, that's interesting. But I, I still wonder, though, it just doesn't seem practical. Do you know what I mean? During during rush hour, you know, how during other times, but just seems it just feels limiting. Maybe that's just in my head. Well, I think it's just a matter of thinking outside the box. Or when you in say the box. Uh, practicality the granola, the granola or box. in <laughs> literally in the little cabin. <laughs> but I think it's because we're just used to driving. You know, we're used to driving on a roadway, a highway, or taking, you know, a, a bus or a, you know, a subway train, a high yeah. locomotive sort of thing. I think this is brilliant. I mean, I've always said for years, 
do that along the 401 corridor. You build the stacks and you could go right across. The, the really cool thing, there was pushback. I found this interesting, Christina. There was pushback from some of the communities, the neighborhoods saying, well, I, I don't want a cable car going over when I'm having a barbecue or I'm sitting on my back deck, you know, and they're looking down. This uh, These gondolas... As they pass over certain neighborhoods when they're very close to homes, the windows will automatically mist up. That's crazy. So they can't <laughs> even see out. <laughs> well, I don't know, is it? It's like, what's I going mean, on it's there? to the advantage of the homeowner. I, yeah. Listen, you wanted romance? There's the Mile There's High a- Club now. <laughs> now. Now you've got, got the misty windows. <laughs> That's, you know what? I'm curious how that'll how Come that'll on. Out. I mean, I do think you know. I'm I'm just thinking. So in, in some places in Europe, they have funiculars that go up the yeah. the big big hills and stuff. And yes, it's, it's yeah very useful and practical, and that's part of their transportation. Yeah. So yeah, why not? I, I think this. The only thing I see possibly is weather stopping it. Right, if there's intense storms or maybe some wind, but I think this to me, may be a real solution that possibly uh, will be looked at from other countries because I just think the cost factor, because all you need are the towers, right? And the cable, you erect these and then push it across. I think it's brilliant. Uh, They're claiming that it'll be ready to go by 2025. Um, So we'll have to keep an eye on it. But I'll tell you, if I go to Paris, when all this COVID nonsense is done, I'm going in one of those just for the sake of it because I think it'll be a neat experience. That's my thought. I think we should put money on which is finished first, this which hasn't even started, or the Eglinton subway line in Toronto. <laughs> and we'll see which actually yeah, gets up and running yeah, first. List, I Ooh, know where I'm putting my money, just for the record. <laughs> All right, let's get to our final story here. We're going to travel to the southeast uh, portions of Asia and take in the unforgettable smell of the corpse flower. Now, this is an interesting story. Oh, it's a, it's a stinky one, that's for sure. Um, yeah. yeah. So so here on the west coast right now, it is almost spring. We have these little crocuses. They're pretty. They're blue. They smell lovely. Yeah. Not these stinky flowers that we're talking about now in Indonesia. Okay. It's called a rafflesia, mm. and it's a bizarre, one of a kind right. cork of nature, actually called, which we'll call it now. It's easier to pronounce the corpse flower, and that's because it smells like rotting flesh, rotting right. meat. It's also called the giant padma. So it's so rare that a scientist on the island of Java is making it her life's work to save this flower from extinction. So I mentioned Mm -hmm. it's a a strange quirk of nature. So imagine, if you will, it's a plant really with no leaves, no roots, no stems. Uh, It's basically has a one meter long, that's about three foot or so, 11 kilogram, 25 Mm -hmm. pounds bloom that just... Every few months or even years, (laughs) blossoms, comes out for about a week stinks terribly and that's in order to attract yeah. the flies that will then cross pollinate and then goes right. away again right so it doesn't sound like something you know usually people want to save the cute little endangered sweet cute little animals not the stickiest plant on the planet right <laughs> <laughs> and this plant also it doesn't even rely no. on photosynthesis right you know you always learn about that in right. school how plants work that this is this yes. is parasitic it sits on a vine and basically sucks all the water and nutrients and energy out of the vine so it yeah. doesn't even do its own work so it's it's almost barely a plant so uh it's only found in the rainforests on the islands of java uh right. not java and S- sumatra rather sumatra and uh sumatra right sumatra and borneo i believe so this uh in 70 years of trying, seven decades, uh, mm-hmm. botanists just haven't been able to get it, to, do it to reproduce. And again, because it's so tricky, because it, it blooms so infrequently for such a short time, and it needs one yeah. of the opposite sex close enough that these flies can go to the male one right. and then go over to the female one and right. pollinate it, right? So it's all been very, very difficult. Maybe that's the thing. It's got everything going against it, and that's why it needs to be saved, right? I mean, it's obviously, it has some purpose in in terms of an ecosystem. I don't know what that is. But the fact, you know, things that you've listed, uh, it is so, you know, unconventional and what it does. And and that putrid smell, it has been certainly the center of many newscasts over the years, uh, depending on where they are in the world. In fact, you know, Toronto Zoo has has a few. And and, and it's that that. smell because the... 
stinks. Okay, because the smell doesn't last too long, but it is a very strong smell. And as you, you mentioned, the idea is that it, it attracts, you know, dung beetles or flesh flies and other carnivorous insects that'll be drawn to it thinking it is literally fresh meat. And, and what I found really interesting, this plant can also turn up the heat. It can, it can intensify the warmth on it to simulate what, you know, a corpse would be literally yeah. right to around 37 Celsius, the, the temperature of a human body. So I think that's all fascinating. And the fact that nobody has been able to do this up until this point, she obviously knows something. She's dedicated many years to it. I wish her success. I think it's a really neat. Obviously a very patient person because this all started back in 2004 and it took about four years just to wow. grow one flower. <laughs> And, and, you know, you want to say since then it's been slowly, but surely, no, it's not slowly, but surely it's, it's completely unpredictable. About 90% of the buds have died, but the bright side. Oh. So National Geographic has done a really good in-depth article about this one project. And they talk about one of the bright mm -hmm. sides being, even if she doesn't manage to grow that many of these bizarre plants, the publicity right. of being able to get stems and send them to different botanical gardens around the world so people can see them and understand uh -huh. they're hoping it'll increase ecotourism to Indonesia. So then they'll have money to support mm -hmm. and protect them. And it'll just increase awareness that anytime, uh, you know, they find one in the wildlife in Indonesia, they can immediately get government protection for yeah. it and attention to it. And as you mentioned, headlines, I, I mean, I, 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 it's periodically in the headlines here in North America. In Toronto, there's one, Hamilton, sure. uh, and I believe Vancouver. So yeah. those rare times, because it can take months, sometimes years to get that yeah. one years. bloom. Mm -hmm. So it blooms and every yeah. news station, every photographer is there. They've got to see it. You know, maybe they'll have a little nose clip or something, <laughs> but it's there. <laughs> so, so it's interesting that even if it's not, that's successful in the traditional way that you'd expect just growing more of this particular plant. Right. There's, there's a different sort of success that you can measure this on. So yeah, it's a, it's a different well, kind of plant. It could be and, the star of a horror movie kind of. <laughs> 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 and maybe it is uh, who knows maybe it is you know it's the plot line of, st of some exactly. stories we don't know about but i still think there's got to be some reason that nature has put it there i don't know what that is but you know you mentioned about the zoo the one at the zoo they've named it vincent van gross but <laughs> it's in the same fashion there are some animals that would no longer be in existence had it not been for zoos people will say oh yeah. zoos are cruel well. listen i Many zoos will tell you they would love to be put out of business and to just have, you know, these animals living in the wild. But sadly, it doesn't happen because of poaching and that sort of thing. So they do, especially the Toronto Zoo, they work very hard at uh, conservation efforts. And maybe that's an extension with, you know, the corpse flower. You know, some of these species of plants that would really just die off. So you have to sort of do your own uh, intervention. And I look forward to following this story with this particular researcher to see the success because I think who knows where it leads. Who knows? You know, maybe this coarse flower has a real significant role uh, in humanity. Who knows? It's just a matter of discovering it. Exactly. Maybe. We will have to debate the whole zoo issue on another show, though, just so you know. We'll have to totally different uh, animals oh. versus flora okay. versus fauna, if you will. Uh, side note, I was mentioning okay. pretty flowers here. We do have our own stinky West Coast. I don't know the official name, but it's known as skunk cabbage. So a lot of trails where it's really damp, oh. kind of swampy uh, in the rainforest yeah. areas, you, you start to think there's a skunk around and it's just this kind of lettucey looking leafy thing and it's called skunk cabbage and yes it stinks like a skunk but it's there are many many of them it's nowhere near extinct there are plenty so <laughs> no shortage you know i'm gonna have to look that up now that's skunk interesting yeah. it's, it's called a skunk cabbage you say? yeah, yeah. i don't know it's the official up. name great. is that's just what it's known as so right yeah well, the other one is corpse flower, and that's not the official name either, but that's what we sure. know it as. Yes, so anyway, we're going to have to wrap it right there, Christina. Always a pleasure. Thank you so much. I look forward to connecting with you again on another episode. You too. See you later. Please support our work. If you are watching on YouTube, please like and subscribe to my channel. It costs you absolutely nothing. And if you're watching it on my Facebook page, please like, love, share, and follow the page. Have yourself a wonderful day, and I look forward to having your company again here on The Blue Files.